Welcome, everyone. Happy to see that many people here. And very happy to know that there are even more people online, more than 260 people uh, registered. So everyone online, very welcome. If you do have questions for the people online, there is a text balloon in the right corner. You just can click on that and then you can put your question. We will register all questions and we'll ask as many as possible to uh, the two art historians presented present here. The first you're going to hear is Gary Schwartz. I'm really happy to introduce him. He is an art historian, author of books on Geronimus Bos, Pieter Samerdam, Rembrandt van Rijn, and more than one or two, and Johannes Vermeer. Schwartz was for many years a publisher of books and journals on art, and in 1998, uh, he founded Co-Art, Co a network organization of museum curators of Dutch and Flemish art still flourishing. He has curated guest exhibitions for museums in the Netherlands and abroad. Schwartz was the recipient of the last Prince Bernard Culture Front Prize for the Humanities before the prize was discontinued. Gary has explicitly asked me to tell you about the coming installment of his online blog, The Schwartz List. That is uh, a pioneering quarter century ago already in uh, 1996. And there, there will be the number 400 installment. Uh, do subscribe, it's free of charge and it's very, very interesting. So go to The Schwartz List. Gary, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. There's uh, some water. Okay, putting on my timer. There we go. Because this is a museum talk, I'm going to start by telling you a word about code art. I started it in 1998, together with the Institut Collectie Nederland, Netherlands Institute for Cultural Heritage. And um, it's aimed at bringing together all the curators and all the collections across the world of Dutch and Flemish art, which I discovered as a student were many. Any major museum you go to has a few rooms of Dutch and Flemish uh, art, mostly painting. And um, this became a central point from the Netherlands to give those people a platform and a way to inform their own audiences and audiences across the world of their activities. So I urge you to take out subscriptions to Code Art as well as the Schwartz List. You get notification 10 days before opening and closing dates of events in this field. Now, the museum that launched the program, the, uh, the project of Rembrandt's Orient is housed in a reconstructed 18th century uh, town palace in the Altermarkt in Potsdam. It's a private initiative launched by the man on the right, Hasso Plotner, who uses his wealth after he sold his software, business software company, SAP, to fund various worthy projects, including this museum. Well, we started on Rembrandt's Orient with it. Oh, there's the other a part of the slide I was missing. Uh, this is what you'll be getting when you subscribe to Code Art uh, in the mail. Here is the director of the museum, Otto Westheider, and her chief curator, uh, Michael Philipp. And joining us in the project were the curators of Kunstmuseum Basel. And this was extremely important. It's one thing for a museum like the Barberini to start a Rembrandt project, but the collection that they have is Impressionists. And museums 
tend to be very uh, unsentimental about what they lend and don't lend. The first thing they'll ask themselves when they get a loan request is, what can we borrow from them? And to ask Rembrandts uh, and not having anything to offer in return uh, than, uh, well, Monet's, that's the big draw of the Barberini, uh, would have made things extremely difficult. So when Bodo Brinkmann got my request for a loan, he immediately asked for the exhibition, and that was a wonderful moment in the history of this project. And it was great working with him and Gabriel Detta. In the course of the work, we of course had to plan a hanging scheme, and we did this in a very simple way with uh, reduced uh, uh, images of the paintings and uh, objects and pasting them onto, onto sheets. We ended up with uh, these seven categories uh, that came out of the material. We didn't try to impose uh, our own categories on the materials that we encountered. Uh, we were able to fit everything we came across by way of oriental motifs uh, and uh, associations uh, in uh, these categories. The Barberini has a wonderful uh, strategy for bringing in the texts that they need for the essays in the catalog, and that is to hold 12 months before the opening of an exhibition a symposium to which the speakers are invited who are also going to be authors of the catalog. And so uh, we met at, the, at this event, which was also fun. We uh, got to be taken out by the museum. That's uh, Arnaut on the left. Uh, in the ba back, there's, in the middle, it's uh, Eric Spans and uh, Jan de Hont, uh, Bodo Brinkmann, and Rolof van Gelder, who uh, all contributed to the catalog, which I'll show you right now. It's really uh, quite a big and imposing uh, publication. Came out in English and in German. So you also have fun in the company of colleagues when you work on an exhibition like this. This is the invitation to the opening in Basel. Now, originally, the exhibition was planned to be opened in, Bar in the Barberini in Potsdam on June 20th, 2020, and you all know what happened to prevent that. Fortunately, the museums were able to switch the, the order in which the exhibition was being hung, so instead of opening in uh, Potsdam in June, it went to Basel in October and then moved on in February, March 2021 to um, Potsdam. This worked for the lenders. We were extremely relieved that nobody backed down when we asked for this uh, reversal of the order. But as you see, uh, this was going to be a glamorous event on October 29th, 2020. Uh, I was going to give the closing speech and a high point of my social life. And uh, it didn't happen. Uh, Basel, the Canton Basel, uh, instituted a 10-day quarantine a week before the opening, and they have had to simply open the doors of the museum to a limited number of visitors without holding this uh, wonderful opening. Now, West meets East in Dutch art of the 17th century. I'm going to show you a really gorgeous, important example of what that could mean. I don't have a light here for my paper. Um, yeah. 1603 saw the outbreak of the Ottoman Safavid War between the Turks and the Persians. 
which was to last for 15 years. It was natural for Shah Abbas I of Persia to look for an alliance with the Holy Roman Empire, which was fighting the Ottomans in the West. They, would, they had been at war since 1593 in the Long Turkish War. In 1605, he sent a high-level diplomatic delegation to the court of Rudolf II in Prague, led by Mahdi Kulibeg. Rudolf paid the envoy the compliment of having his portrait engraved by the Flemish artist Echidiu Sadler, who had been working for him since 1595. Pains were taken to have a Persian inscription on the sitter carved into the plate. The form of his plume was that prescribed in the form of Islam practiced in Persia, known as Twelver Shia for the 12th Imam. The example was so inspiring that the Persian envoy engaged another Netherlandish artist in Prague, the Harlem painter Cornelis Klaus Haida, to become court painter to Shah Abbas. Haida never made it to Persia. His ship was captured by the Portuguese and he was sent to Goa. He ended up working for the Mughal court and the Dutch East India Company in India. How I wish I could tell you that the image on the screen was typical for West East, West East artistic relations in Rembrandt's Netherlands. It is not. There is not a single drawing, print, or painting by a Dutch artist of the entire 17th century that begins to come close to the Sadler portrait in terms of reliability or respect for an individual from the East. The painting that gave the impetus for the exhibition is more typical. It is not a portrait, but a trony, a face painting of an anonymous model. About Rembrandt's turbans, his biographer Arnold Haubrachen tells us that several of his pupils have declared to me that he could spend a day or two arranging one, arranging one to suit his taste, to suit his taste. This is an exaggeration, but it tells us something that we need to know. The turban was a studio prop, not the personal dress of a man of the East. What Dutch artists gave us were fictive Orientals. Rembrandt's example was not lost on his pupils and followers, as in this more monumental version by Ferdinand Boll, nearly 40 years later. Thronies were popular, they were easy, easy to relate to, uh, kind of flattering and undemanding, and in this case, rather luscious. What we see is superior picture making more than reporting or documenting, even depicting uh, something that's come to you from strange, from foreign parts. I wish we could have had this painting in the exhibition, but it was stolen from us by Leiden and by Oxford since it was lent by the Metropolitan Museum of Art to the Young Rembrandt exhibition that, that preceded ours by uh, just a, a few months. As for documentary accuracy, at first sight, you might think that Valeran's, Valeran Fayan's portrait of, portrait of Soliman III, as it's labeled, was a worthy successor to the portrait of Mahdi Kulibeg. It wasn't. There never was a Sultan Soliman III. No more said about that. The only real portraits brought back by Dutch artists from the East were portraits of the governor's general of the Dutch East India Company in Batavia. Here's one of them. And there were two, two sets made, one for the headquarters of the VOC in Batavia and the other for the uh, seat of the company in Amsterdam. Uh, they're both now in the Rijksmuseum. We weren't able to borrow any for the exhibition because they're in such terrible shape that the Rijksmuseum, which has not taken care of them since they're so uninteresting as art objects, uh, didn't feel justified in lending them. Now, 
having disabused you of the notion that Dutch artists engaged in serious observation or study of Eastern persons or ways, let's look at more of what they did do. And in the two museums, uh, online visits have been mounted, which are still online. So I invite you, here's the URL at the bottom of the screen. This is the Basel venue. You can go in and following <coughs> these arrows, move from room to room, and clicking on a painting gives you uh, information uh, about, uh, about it. <coughs> and here is the uh, Barberini hanging, which we're going to follow now. It starts with this fabulous full-length standing uh, portrait of, uh, of a man I'll tell you about in a second. But you can see that the medium itself is carrying a message. Portraits of this kind, full-length, life-size standing portraits, were invented 100 years earlier than this by Titian Antonius Moore for Emp the Emperor. It started moving down the social scale after that and became available for mere kings and counts and with Van Dyck, the, arist the aristocracy of uh, Genoa and of England. Uh, but starting in the 1630s, it was taken over in the Netherlands for mere commoners. Think of uh, Martin and Opium, it's paintings of that kind. And here was a man with a wonderful name, um, Aswer Jacob Schimmelpenning van der Oye, who was nothing more, more than a, a minor administrator in Zutphen. But his family was befriended with Cornelis Tromp, and at the age of 27, Asfero sailed with him on the first stage of a pilgrimage journey to the Holy Land. He kept detailed, a detailed journal, revealing him to be traveling in a Christian Levant. Old and New Testament locations, crusader churches and fortresses, contemporary Christian life. He was reliving the incarnation and the passion here are some of his entries. 28th May, 1658, we took the sad walk, by which he means the Via Dolorosa, and saw the Church of the Knights of Malta. The house where St. Peter was imprisoned is still a prison. Actualization of a mythic past is what he was doing. Every location was branded with categories he brought with him from the uh, Christian Netherlands. A long mile from here, the potters pointed out to us a large square ruin, which was the house of the righteous Simeon. This kind of naive acceptance of fake news uh, was uh, really uh, a great joy for, uh, for Asuerus. He calls all the locals Turks. He makes only a few passing references to mosques. He never went into one, as far as we know, and he didn't even say anything about the souks, where he must have bought some of those gorgeous clothes he's wearing. This is emblematic of a view of the, <coughs> of the Orient <coughs> by Dutch travelers. <coughs> Even in the Levant itself, a Dutch Christian like us where was looking in a mirror. <coughs> So what could you expect from people who stayed at home? Well, here are some of them. Oh, I should have had this up while we were talking about it. <clears throat> the uh, figure of the Oriental standing beside him must have been part of his journal report because he didn't bring him back. He did maybe bring back the dog, which uh, takes up, takes more attention than he does even. Okay, here we have a uh, 
At the back of the first gallery, the doorway is flanked by two large paintings by Albert Kaup. Both have the same build-up, two groups of figures on the sides with a distant view between them. This is the kind of display that gives the curators a thrill when they start setting up the hanging of an exhibition. Okay, that, that's not why they're here. The sitters for the group portrait in Budapest on the left have been identified by John Laumann as members of the Sum family of Dordrecht. They were wine merchants and uh, Albert Kaup symbolized that by putting a view of the town of Bachrach on the Rhine uh, between the two groups. Uh, Bachrach was, is where still a lot of Rheinhessen wine comes from uh, and its name was uh, thought of to be derived from the name of the god Bacchus, uh, the god of, of wine. The trees behind Jan Jacobs, uh, Jacobs and Sam, the father of the family, and his wife Katharina Wolfratz shows them to be the progenitors of the family tree. Our curiosity to know who uh, they were and what they're at is uh, only increased by the oriental touches. The turban, turbans of the man on the upper left, the boy in the foreground, and the young man on the right uh, are all identified by, uh, by Laumann. And he says concerning the, uh, the man in the upper right uh, that he was married in 1653 to the daughter of the Psalms. His name was Arant Hutenus. And his turban is perhaps meant to identify him as Isaac of the biblical couple of Isaac and Rebecca. So there's an element of portrait historier built in there. Well, the figures on the right are not really Oriental. They're more associated with Eastern European attire and with the hunt. So we have a hodgepodge of signs, symbols, associations, which were not necessarily intended to be understood by anyone outside the family. It was a commission uh, for the family. I can't help thinking of a detail in the portrait of Oswald Schimmelpenning. The letter plays a particular function, as in any painting in which they are introduced. There's also a, the uh, Arendt is pointing his finger at a letter being presented to him. They punch a hole in the unity of time and place suggested by a static painting. There's a world out there, but it's only hinted at, never or hardly ever entered. The other painting by Kaup, although it has the same general arrangement, is a full-fledged portrait historier. This is from Kunstmuseum Basel. They were able to bring it into the exhibition. I didn't know about it when I was making my hit wish list of what I wanted but it was marvelous to be able to place it uh, next to that uh, 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 painting from Budapest. Thanks to an entry in an inventory of the main sitter himself, we know exactly what it represents. An extraordinary, extraordinarily large painting with portraits of the deceased, his wife, children, and other members of the family portrayed as the story of David and Abigail. The action of the figures actually does not correspond to uh, the Bible text in which Abigail throws herself on the ground in front of David saying, the Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. So the sentiment expressed and not the exact poses of the figures would seem to be the reason for the choice of this subject as the characters in a family group portrait. 
This is not my favorite group portrait, Historie, in the exhibition. My favorite is on the adjoining wall. There it is. It's the wedding feast of Grietje Hermans von Hasselt and Jochen Bernsen von Haake, read in the Bürkerk in Utrecht in 1636. And it's presented as the wedding of King Achasveros and Queen Esther, with Esther's uncle Mordechai sitting beside her at the table. A number of other suggestions have been made for the identification of the subject, but this is certainly the most convincing. In the background, we see a uh, motif that fits also the story of Esther, uh, and that is the expulsion from the court of Ahasuerus' first wife, uh, Vashti. Actually, I only saw that detail when my wife asked me about it and at the exhibition itself. Uh, it turns out to have been noticed by uh, others who wrote about the painting. Now, the bride is a von Hasselt, and the painter is a von Hasselt. Who is he? The museum sticks by the only two uh, painters documented in Utrecht in the 1630s as active. That are those are um, Jacob. Isaacs von Hasselt and, no, they, I, 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 a second, I, I've forgotten their names, but neither of them has any work attributed to them. Uh, I follow the identification first broached by my late colleague, Leonard Slatkus, and that is a painter named Jan Lukas von Hasselt, and I'm going to tell you more about him. He traveled in the 1610s with an amazing Italian nobleman uh, who was also a composer, Pietro Dalla Valle, whose travel journal was published in various European languages. And he uh, took von Hasselt to uh, Egypt and to Aleppo and uh, finally in um, Isfahan, where they came to the court of the great Shah Abbas. He was one of the uh, nine members of the entourage. Pietro della Valle said that he went on this journey in order to get over a lost love. And he was full of, of romantic sentiment as he was making his travels. In Aleppo, someone showed him the portrait of a, a Syrian Christian woman who lived in Baghdad. He fell in love with the portrait, traveled to Baghdad, and within a month married her. Her name was uh, uh, Sidi Mani Gyoreda. The portrait we have of Sidi Mani is a print after a detail of a full length oil portrait of her that was painted by young Lukas van Hasselt. Pietro writes that he didn't like it very much, for one thing, because it shows her in Syrian clothing that she hardly ever wore, but he also was disappointed in the quality. Nonetheless, his portrait took on new meaning after, in 1621, Sidi uh, died. Pietro Dalla Valle did not bury her. He had her embalmed and took her body with him on the rest of his travels, not getting back to Rome until 1624, when he, when he had her uh, buried in, in state. And, uh, I was able to borrow a catalog, a copy of the catalog, thanks to Arnaud's help from the University uh, Library of Leiden. Now, at the exhibition, uh, again, Luki uh, pointed out 
a certain resemblance between the uh, physiognomy and the, the pose of CD in the, uh, here I show it in reverse, portrait uh, uh, of the wife of Pietro Dallo Valli and uh, Geert um, van Hasselt in, in Utrecht. And I think that this goes some way to support an attribution to Jan Lukas, certainly in the absence of any competing uh, comparable uh, uh, works. He was uh, an important person at the court. Jan Lukas van Hasselt used his access to the Shah as an artist in order to build a diplomatic and political career uh, that made a tremendous impression. He was able, in a mission to the States General sent by the Shah, to carry out the only bilateral agreement made between the uh, governments of a, an Eastern country and the Dutch state. But there was so much intrigue going on that he uh, lost out in his maneuvering in the court and was stranded in the Netherlands where he had the opportunity to paint uh, that painting which I attribute to him. And he was the forerunner of uh, this tremendous event. It's by Jan Baptist Venix in the Rijksmuseum. It's actually, uh, actually a, an image of a real event when the Dutch ambassador, Johan Cuneus, landed on the shores of the Persian Gulf and was received by Persian emissaries to be taken to the court at Isfahan. Uh, one of the members of that group was the painter uh, Philips Angel, a Leiden artist <coughs> uh, who himself became, after Jan Lukas van Leiden, a court painter uh, to the Shah. More than just for its intrinsic interest, Jan van Hasselt's painting is also important for its impact on none other than Rembrandt. Rembrandt Samson was painted three years later, and it was praised by that Philips Angel I mentioned in an address by him to the Leiden St. Luke Society, uh, Association in 1642 as a model of serious history painting based on research and, gen and genuine uh, knowledge. My only regret uh, re with regard to the hanging of the exhibition uh, is that these two paintings, and only in the Barberini was the Rembrandt uh, 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 to be shown, uh, they were not hung next to each other. Nevertheless, Rembrandt certainly uh, Rembrandt certainly didn't copy it uh, directly, but I don't think there's any doubt that he knew an image of an Eastern wedding as Van Hassel painted it, and that he made use of the pictorial concept with a similar grouping of the figures, left, right, and middle. This too is not generally accepted by my colleagues. I don't understand why. The bridal couple is seated at a table with white tablecloth in front of a grand hanging of similar form. In Rembrandt's painting, the bridegroom, Samson, is leaning away from the Philistine bride from Timnah, whose name we don't know, in a premonition of things to come. The golden cup in the, uh, on the table in front of uh, Samson's bride is uh, a helical variant on the cup held prominently by Mordechai in the Van Hassel painting. The speaking hands with which Van Hassel and Rembrandt show themselves as predecessors of Irma Slaus. I must admit that it gives me an extra kick to find Rembrandt borrowing not from Titian and Peter Lastman, but from an artist so obscure that we're not even sure of his name. So my colleagues will come around to me maybe uh, after I'm gone. Back to the galleries in Potsdam. The star painting in the next room is another full-length standing life-size portrait. This one, Cesar van Everdingen's portrait of Wollebrand Geleins de Jong, 1674, from the Alkmaar Museum. Now, this is the image 
that you would see if you were doing the online tour and you clicked on the painting on the wall, you get the label uh, next to it with basic information. This is a very disarming uh, uh, personality. He was an orphan and raised in Alkmaar, uh, the uh, charity of the municipality and its members. He worked himself up in the Dutch East India Company to become not only a uh, chief merchant, but also a military uh, uh, commander, which he combined these two functions when he attacked an island off the coast of the, in the Persian Gulf to uh, enforce a point in negotiations with the Persians about giving rights to the import of silver and silk. Well, I want to step back and to tell you something that happened after the exhibition was hung. We were expecting some kind of discussion of proprietariness and uh, and, and ethics in the subject, and we got a frontal attack from a, a German and uh, Swiss uh, a pair of uh, women, Lucy Duggan and Sudena Steinemann. They accused us of having ignored the colonialism and racism built into the subject that we were treating. Well, I reacted uh, in correspondence with them, uh, and I thought very decisively, why don't you take me to task, I wrote, for not browbeating visitors to the exhibition to wake up to the long suppressed evils of how Dutch exploitation of the natural resources of Asia, Asia contributed to the deterioration of the environment, or why the stimulation of consumer culture by the import of expensive products that nobody needed led to the hollowing out of Western civilization. What about the Dutch role in spreading the smoking of tobacco and causing millions of deaths to lung cancer or foisting off cheap sugar on us so obesity is killing millions more? What about Christians bossing Muslims in Indonesia for 350 years and how it led to the clash of civilizations? And shouldn't we have lambasted the financing of the Dutch enterprise in East India which is the first major limited liability company, stood at the birth of capitalism and all the inequalities and injustices that engendered. Did anyone even ask how old were those Indian and Turkish and Moroccan and Japanese girls, none of them in a Dutch colony, who spun the silk yarn that went into those gorgeous blouses, the little girls who wrote those, who wove those exquisite carpets, printed that flashy chintz, sewed those chic robes, End of quote. Well, I still stand behind this, and who knows, maybe all of these issues will come up one after the other, but being confronted with having ignored colonialism and racism, I must admit that if we had started this exhibition in 2020 rather than 2016, uh, we probably would have paid more attention uh, to these issues. Even just look at the Africans attending Wolobrand uh, Geleins de Jong. These were people uprooted out of their, their birthplace and whether they were slaves or not, uh, were uh, forced into the uh, role of, uh, of, of helpers of, uh, of Dutch uh, wealthy people. So thanks to Lucy and Serena for engaging me in this discussion. Since time is going short, I will skip the discussion of this. You can uh, look it up. It has to do with a fabulous uh, painting by um, Thomas de Keyser after a um, stained glass window that Peter Lossmann made for the Zouderkerk in Amsterdam, which uh, Rembrandt borrowed uh, for here you see Rembrandt's uh, etching of the Triumph of Mordechai, in which he uses the uh, motif of, from Lassmann's painting of the subject, and also you can barely see it, but here is a, an image of the dome in a, uh, under an arch, as uh, he saw it from uh, Lassmann's uh, window. 
on the right is a painting from Basel of uh, Rembrandt with David and Goliath, which helped us to uh, illustrate Rembrandt's borrowings from, um, from Rubens. <coughs> Another of my theories that I don't see how anybody could doubt is that Rembrandt based his self-portrait as an Oriental on this painting by Rubens of Nicolas de España. I reversed the, the Rubens here to, to illustrate just how close they, they are to each other. <coughs> but the great object of the exhibition, of course, should have been the 25 copies that Rembrandt made after uh, Mughal drawings. And because the Getty Museum, this is the most famous one, of the uh, imam sitting under a tree. These uh, objects, the Mughal miniatures, were actually clipped up into pieces and mounted into cartouches in the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna. So this was another piece of appropriation of Eastern art for Western taste. Uh, the Getty Museum held an exhibition in which they borrowed all of these drawings, so we weren't able to get more than one. We were very relieved when the Albertina decided to uh, allow us to show their, their drawing. We wanted to show it next to this wonderful miniature from the Chester Beatty collection, but this was a uh, victim of COVID. We weren't able to get the, uh, the courier to come over with the, with the drawing from Dublin. Oh, here is that uh, thing again. But we did get from Schoenbrunn uh, these uh, cartouches, which show how they were treated, uh, clipped up, and, uh, and put into that form. I'll skip that. And ask, in conclusion, mm -hmm. what's it all about? Mm -hmm. It's easy to poo-poo the Dutch culture creators and consumers of the 17th century for their self-importance. Rembrandt, more than any of them, just look at this. But in the course of making the exhibition and thinking about now it's here and, almost, and gone, it's myself that I am relativizing. How much broader is my own conception of the East? Until a year and a half ago, I had never heard of or had never paid attention, if I did hear of it, of the city of Wuhan, with a population two-thirds the size of the Netherlands. The thing to do is to admit that my own world is just as much a bubble as was that of Rembrandt's Orient to him and his contemporaries. It's not the kind of bubble that can be pricked to burst, I think, but I should be able to blow it up larger and make it reflect more and more colors and images, and not only of my own face. Thank you, and I'm now turning over the floor to Arnaud. Thank you very much, Gary. I first start the PowerPoint, and then I introduce Arnaud to you. Right. Our second speaker today is Arnold Frolok. He studied Middle Eastern languages at Utrecht and Amsterdam and obtained his doctorate from Leiden University with a thesis on the occasional and humorous poetry of an Egyptian author from the 15th century. He has been curator of Oriental manuscripts and rare books at Leiden University libraries since 2005, and he is interpress Legati Waniriani, or keeper of the Oriental collection at Leiden, the 18th in succession of Albert Schultes, that's 1729. He's former president of Malcolm International, the European Association of Middle Eastern Librarians. He has published several monographs and many articles on the history of Middle Eastern studies in the Netherlands and the Oriental collections at Leiden. 
His most recent monograph is an introduction of the Thousands and One Nights in the Dutch Republic in the 18th century, together with Richard van Leeuwen. Thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Okay, I'd like to thank Professor Stein Bussels for inviting me today and Gary Schwartz, the internationally celebrated Rembrandt expert, for allowing me to join the Rembrandt's Orient project at Museum Barberini in Potsdam and Kunstmuseum Basel, and today also here in Leiden. Um, <clears throat> in this brief presentation, I will go into a very basic question. Which printed images did Rembrandt use or own to obtain a reliable or almost reliable picture of the Middle East and its peoples? And secondly, what do these pictures tell us about the development of academic oriental studies in the Netherlands and at Leiden in particular? I shall begin with Rembrandt's experience with academia. At the age of 13 or 14, Rembrandt matriculated at the University of Leiden in 1620 as a student in the Faculty of Letters. Rembrandt, son of Hermann from Leiden, student of letters, 14 years of age, living with his parents. Until quite recently, his academic career used to be dismissed as brief and superficial, but colleagues of mine at the University Library at Leiden have recently discovered that he rematriculated at the university in 1622 at the age of 15. But it still remains anybody's guess whose classes he followed and what he actually learned. He must have known that there was a professor of Arabic and other Oriental languages, a certain Thomas Erpenius or Thomas von Erpe, but there is no evidence at all that Rembrandt followed his, his lessons. Neither is it very likely that he knew about a tiny collection of 50 Middle Eastern manuscripts in the university library um, kept, kept in this, this book cabinet here on the right. Um, and even if he had known about them, he could not have seen them because students were not allowed in the library. Good idea. And neither is it very likely that Rembrandt ever saw a very special and precious oriental object in the library, on the, on the picture on the right. It is an almost 12 meter wide panorama of the city of Constantinople or Istanbul. It's a work by the Danish artist Melchior Lorch, or Lorch, Lorichs, from Flensburg. Um, who spent the late 1550s in Istanbul in the entourage of an envoy of the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, the Fleming Ohir Guilain von Busbeke, or Busbekius, um, who led the negotiations with Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, the emperor of the vast Ottoman Empire. In the mid-16th century, the Ottoman Empire was a superpower, which comprised not only present-day Turkey, but also most of the Arab world. In the West, the Ottomans occupied the Balkans and their dominions stretched as far as Hungary, almost reaching the gates of Vienna without actually ever getting there. During his lengthy stay, Loch also made drawings of the Sultan, his courtiers, officials and soldiers. Woodcuts made from these drawings were reprinted until the end of the 17th century. I admit that this is getting us nowhere to reach our purpose, but I must beg for your patience because the name of Lorg opens up a new line of inquiry. Let me see, next page. Follow. When Rembrandt went bankrupt in 1656, an inventory was drawn up of his possessions. And from this inventory, we know that he owned a considerable collection of books or albums with prints of scenes and peoples from the Ottoman Empire. Most of these images date not from the 17th century, but roughly from the first half of the 16th century. In those days, draftsmen and engravers accompanied the first embassies of France or the Holy Roman Empire to the Grand Seigneur or Sultan in Constantinople, which led to a spate of publications later in the century. These images are, of course, important because they were drawn after life and are not based on the artist's imagination. Rembrandt's estate inventory mentions a book, or more likely album, full of Turkish buildings. Melchior Lorich, there he is again. 
Hendrik van Aalst and others depicting Turkish life. Een boek vol Turkse gebouwen, Melchior Lorer, Hendrik van Aalst en andere meer, uitbeeldende het Turkse leven. In this context, Turkish is a hold all term for any given Muslim people from the Ottoman Empire. Hendrik van Aalst is almost certainly identical with the Flemish painter and engraver Pieter Kukke van Aalst, who in 1533 visited Istanbul in the retinue of the imperial ambassador, the Fleming Cornelis de Schepper. Kukke is most famous for his large multi panel engraving of the journey um, of the ambassadorial train from Serbia to Istanbul which includes many Turks in their flamboyant costume, from the lowliest servant to Sultan Suleiman himself. On the right, on the left, a, a woodcut by, by Melchior Lorich. Another entry in Rembrandt's inventory is a book or album full of curious miniature drawings, as well as various woodcuts and copper prints of miscellaneous costume. A book full curieuze miniature tekeningen, nevens verscheiden hout en kopere printen van alderhande dracht. Such costume books invariably included Turks in their native dress. One of the great centers of engraving and printing where illustrated costume books on the East were published was the city of Antwerp. It was part of the Holy Roman Empire and the Emperor Charles V had his court in nearby Brussels. But it was also close to France, another major European power. In 1553, Peter Kukke van Aalst, Large Panorama, was published in Antwerp by his widow. In 1576, the Antwerp printer Willem Silvius published the illustrated travels of a certain Nicolas de Nicolet, who in 1551 joined the French embassy to the Ottoman Sultan, headed by Gabriel Daramon. The sketches he made were true to life but in the case of high-ranking ladies from the Serai or court, he had recourse to prostitutes, whom he had dressed up in costumes obtained from palace eunuchs. His prints were recycled in many other publications of the period. We cannot prove it, but it is very likely that Rembrandt also owned a copy of this highly popular costume book or its reissues. But again, this is all very well and interesting, but what have these prints to do with the ori origins of Oriental studies in the Dutch Republic? Well, the answer is that the same Western embassies to the Ottoman Empire from the 16th century not only underpinned the visual tradition of Rembrandt's Orient, but also stood at the cradle of Dutch Oriental studies and its collections of manuscripts and rare books. In order to illustrate the origins of this new academic tradition in the nascent Dutch Republic, we must go back to 1534-35, when Francois Premier, the first king of France, sent his ambassador Jean de la Forêt to Istanbul to negotiate a treaty or capitulations with the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. In the constant friction between the Ottomans and the Holy Roman Empire, the Sultan granted both friendship and extensive trading privileges to France, the main contestant of the empire for supremacy in Catholic Europe. In the French ambassador's suite was a French scholar named Guillaume Postel, who had taught himself some Arabic. He returned to France in 1537 after he had improved his Arabic, learned the rudiments of Turkish, and acquired a number of Oriental manuscripts. The following year, in 1538, he became the first professor of Arabic in Western Europe and wrote the first printed grammar of the Arabic language in the West, picture on the right, with um, the first surah of the Quran in, in, in clumsy print. In 1550, he visited Istanbul a second time to join the ambassadorial train of Gabriel Daramont. This Guillaume Postel turned out to be a pivotal figure in the birth of Oriental studies in the Dutch Republic. Some of his pupils eventually made it to Leiden, where they established an Orientalist tradition of their own. It is to these pioneers and their collections of Oriental manuscripts that we shall now turn our attention together with some observations on the political and economical circumstances that accompanied their ascendancy in the Dutch Republic. In 1568, this can't be new to you, uh, Protestant forces in the Dutch Republic, in the, in the Netherlands, rebelled against the Catholic overlord, King Philip II of Spain. In 1575, this led to the foundation of the first university in the Northern Netherlands at Leiden. 
Ten years later, in 1585, the city of Antwerp, the greatest cultural and economic center of the southern Netherlands, was taken by Spanish troops. One of the thousands who sought refuge in the Protestant north was Franciscus Raffelengius of Franz von Ravelingen on the left, a Flemish scholar who had studied Arabic in Paris with the pioneering Arabist Guillaume Postel. He was not only a, a prominent employee of the famous Antwerp printer Christophe Plantin, but also his son-in-law. He was welcomed in Leiden together with many other refugees, started a branch of the Plantin printing office, and received an appointment as professor of Hebrew. He was also the first to teach Arabic at Leiden. He never visited the Orient, but he had a small but select collection of Islamic manuscripts. The first, collection, manus, first Oriental manuscript collection of any size entered the Leiden University Library in 1609 upon the death of the French Protestant scholar Joseph Justice Scaliger. Find on the right, finding life in France becoming increasingly difficult for Protestants due to the upheavals of the French wars of religion, he rather unwillingly emigrated to the Northern Netherlands and in 1593 made his triumphant entry in Leiden as the ornament of Leiden University. In 1562, when he was a student in Paris, Scaliger had taken his first Arabic lessons from the aforementioned scholar Guillaume Postel. And in the last years of his life, he dedicated himself increasingly to the study of these languages, of this language. In this picture on the right for Scaliger, you see a detail. He is working on what looks like an Islamic manuscript. It is, in fact, a fragment of the Quran. But this is a portrait that was finished after his death. And the people can read Arabic, will see that the Arabic manuscript is turned upside down. But never mind. In the early 17th century, the young Dutch Republic started to assert itself as an independent power in an international context. In 1599, the first Dutch ship sailed to the Levant to be followed by countless others in the decades to come. In 1612, Sultan Ahmed I of the Ottoman Empire granted capitulations or extensive diplomatic and commercial privileges to the Dutch Republic. A Dutch ambassador, Cornelis Haga, was dispatched to Istanbul and consulates were established in major centers of commerce such as Smyrna, Izmir, Aleppo and Cairo. The new treaty with the Ottomans opened up unprecedented business opportunities for the Dutch and the profits sustained the power and wealth of the Dutch Republic and its merchant elite. Artists like Rembrandt added Oriental or pseudo-Oriental elements to their work to emphasize their patrons' sudden rise to fortune. Scholarship also profited, profited in a significant way from the new relationship with the Ottoman Empire. Only one year after the capitulations, Leiden University founded a chair for Arabic and appointed Thomas Apenius, the professor who was in function when Rembrandt was a student. Apenius never traveled to the Orient, but his pupil, Jacobus Golius, here on the left, uh, the second professor of Arabic, did go there, and in doing so, acquired a sizable collection of 200 Middle Eastern manuscripts for, from Aleppo and Istanbul. Here in, in the middle, um, an Arabic manuscript on the astrolabe uh, for astro astronomical observations. On the right, a picture of a very elaborate automaton, a water clock that actually functioned and walked by itself as a kind of machine. But some decades later, his efforts were capped off by his pupil Levinus Werner, a German from Lippe who studied Oriental languages under Golias. He graduated in 1644 and left for Istanbul, where he rose to the rank of ambassador for the Dutch Republic to the Ottoman Sultan. He was a wealthy man um, with a discerning taste, and in his spare time, he collected more than 900 Middle Eastern manuscripts in Arabic, Persian, and Ottoman Turkish. And when he died in 1665, he left his entire collection to Leiden University, where he had once been a student. This donation put Leiden firmly on the map as one of the major centers of Oriental learning in Europe. 
I've now come to the end of my presentation, my brief presentation. I hope I have been able to explain to you that early diplomatic contacts with the Ottoman Empire, either foreign or national, stood at the cradle of both Orientalist art and Orientalist studies in the Dutch Republic. The greatest of the artists was no doubt Rembrandt, Harmansohn von Rijn. Oriental studies at Leiden have flourished until the present day. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you for a very nice evening because on the one hand we, we did so, so much art that was or closely or a bit farther related from the Orient but still representing the Orient and then of course all the intellectual milieu in, in Leiden and how far that could be related to, to, to the artists. So we do have many questions of the people online, there were many people online so let's give them uh, so, some, 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 so some of the questions I, I will mention. Uh, and then, of course, the floor is yours for, for some other questions before we go and have a drink at the Academy building. Uh, one of the questions was interesting because it turned up twice. It turned up and in the talk of Gary and in the talk of Arnaud. And it's about the material presence of the Orient. So in how far objects of the Orient, and one of the questions related to the tapestry so clearly there in, in, uh, in Cesar van Everding, in how far that relates to a real object present, and also to you the question, in the costume books, in how far were there no real costumes for the Orient there? That's uh, the first question. Uh, this is a, a sore point. I spent years looking for living, survivals of the kinds of objects in the paintings by Rembrandt and his colleagues. I went, I spent uh, days in, in, in Leiden, in Volkenkunde, with Marty Four looking through the databases for uh, matches, for the jewelry, for the objects. For, the only thing we could find was some weapons that really did it, uh, so that we were forced to abandon our initial uh, ambition to show some realia, real objects, next to the, uh, uh, the things. And as far as the, uh, the carpets are concerned, some of those are fairly, uh, fairly accurate. But when it came to dress, uh, motifs were taken from carpets and just sort of sewn on to uh, the hems and uh, collars and cuffs of uh, imaginary costumes. So, there is really uh, very, there was nothing to go on in order to treat people to uh, those, those matches. Well, we, we do know that Rembrandt actually owned a collection of textiles, and they could have been either Western or Oriental, we don't know, but in any case, they have not survived. Textiles being perishable materials, so they're no longer there. But in general, I would say that there was very little collection of Oriental objects, genuine Oriental objects. Um, maybe some in, in, in the cabinets of curiosities of the richest merchants, but, but not, not in the middle classes. So no, no, never, never anything like it. The, I think um, now, um, in our times, the only substantial collection of, of, of um, Muslim heritage is, I think, the manuscript collection at Leiden University Library. But these were not collected as art objects, but as, as sources of information, yeah. scientific information. So it's different. Much. Another question uh, relates to the uh, resemblance between, on the one hand, the, the, the bride of the Pietro della Vallas uh, and compared to the Van Hassel's wife. Uh, the question is if this is not more related to a fixed tradition in portraits than a direct connection to, between both. Uh, no, I admit that there's a lot of convention in uh, these representations and that um, I couldn't claim that the comparison I showed is proof uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Jan Lukas van Hasselt was the uh, author of the painting of the uh, the Utrecht marriage, uh, but I bring it in as the only available comparison, and I think that it should be taken seriously in in, in those measures. There is a, a lot of simple cliche stereotype uh, stuff. Uh, in, in the portraits and also in the, the history paintings. So you have to 
uh, you know, be aware of this and not make uh, too heavy claims for these uh, arguments. And then uh, a last question from the, from the, from the audience online uh, for uh, Arnaud. The, uh, they were, the, there was one of the, 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 the viewers really struck by that panorama of Istanbul. How big is it and, and how did it come into the collection of Leiden? <clears throat> It's, it's almost 12 meters uh, wide or long, which wow. I say. So it's, it's a really big one. It was cut up into panels. It, wasn't, it was once on display in the university library, as you saw in the engraving of the university library that I showed to you. Um, uh, at a certain point, they got fed up with it and they, they cut it up and stored it in the attic where it was found um, earlier in the last century. Uh, what was your question again? It was, um, who, who brought it here? I think it was brought to, uh, to, to Leiden by the son of, um, of Gerard Duza, the, 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 the vice chancellor of the university in the earliest days of the university, whose son traveled to Istanbul. He died young, but, but he, he did travel to Istanbul and brought it back. Other questions from uh, the auditorium? Sure not, because I still, oh yes, Bram. Yes. I'm briefly, I'm briefly going to repeat for the people online. So the question is, what is the relation between, on one hand, colonialism and Orientalism, and in how far it is not part of the exhibition as such? I think that's, that's a brief summary. Well, working from the material as we did, we didn't find any references to uh, colonial relationships. Uh, as I said, also most of the imaging, imagery was was rather stereotyped. The stuff that was real was taken from uh, 16th century prints, like the ones by uh, Melchior Lorch. You see echoes of it there, uh, and perhaps for that reason, we were uh, insensitive to the issues that are really genuinely involved about material uh, objects and and their role in Dutch life. Uh, this was. Uh, uh, an increasingly uh, important part of Dutch society and, uh, and uh, self-image through the imports of the Dutch East India Company of, uh, of spices, of herbs, of fabrics, of, uh, of, of metals, of collector's objects, of shells and dyes and, and, and so forth. So it permeated uh, Dutch society without it being tainted in a way in the reception by what was happening in the gathering of those materials, especially, of course, the, the spices from, from the islands in which the Dutch committed uh, genocide in order to assure the... Uh, so we, um, you know, looking at the image that was being created by the artists of the East, which is mostly stereotypical, we uh, uh, didn't... Uh, uh, include the criteria that really, I suppose, should be let loose uh, uh, on, uh, on these relations. I, don't, I, I think it is useful to, to realize that um, in the 16th and 17th centuries, um, countries like Persia or the Ottoman Empire were extremely powerful, maybe more and even more powerful than the Christian West. I don't think that, that people in the West regarded them as inferior in any way, I think. They, they looked up to them, admired them, 
criticized their opulence, uh, but, but, but I don't think there was a relation between master and servant or anything like it. Yes, actually, I should add to that that most of the materials didn't come from colon colonized areas at all. Uh, the Dutch, you know, were able to conquer the Moluccas by force of arms. But when they entered Japan, they crawled on their knees to the shogun in order to offer him presents every year to be able to please continue their trade with them. They were petitioners at the court in Isfahan in order to be able to cash in on the silk and, uh, uh, and silver. A trade in North Africa, they were the victims of uh, Barbary uh, uh, raids on shipping, which uh, actually took as many as one million Christian sol sailors and soldiers into slavery before they could be bought back. Rembrandt, could. but so it's you know I, I apologize for not dealing with, it, but if you really want to do justice to it, it's a much more varied picture than just the idea of the Dutch colonizing peoples in Asia. All right, that's a good uh, sentence to end because now there's drinks.